In the wake of our discussion of question number one, let's embark upon question number two. According to Jewish tradition, how did Moses get the book of Genesis? On what basis does he know about creation, since people had not yet been created? How do you relate to the Bible's description of creation, the Garden of Eden, and similar stories? So, of course, there are a number of components in this question, and we're going to have to develop some additional points on the way to addressing them all, but to focus at least at the outset on the opening component. According to Jewish tradition, how did Moses get the book of Genesis? On the face of it, I can answer that question in a very simple, straightforward manner. How did Moses get the book of Genesis? God told him. Not only do I mean that God told him in general terms, God dictated. But in order to appreciate what I mean by what I just said, in order to fully integrate the implications of that statement, I need to backtrack and develop some more basic material that I think is critical in order for us to move forward. In particular, when we speak of God's giving Moses the Torah, there is a very basic definition here that I feel compelled to clarify. And that is, what do I mean by Torah? Which sounds, of course, at the face of it, like a very simple question to which to respond, but it really isn't because, truth be told, when Jews use the word Torah, they can mean any of various different things. Which isn't so surprising, after all, when one considers that Torah means instruction and teaching. And since, after all, there are many different strata of instruction and teaching, we use the word Torah in different senses. So, for example, we often speak of the written Torah as equivalent to the entire Hebrew Bible. We also often speak of the oral Torah, the oral teachings that as a foundation of Jewish belief go hand in hand with the written Torah, something we spoke about at some previous junctures in particular in our discussion last year of Exodus chapter 21. And there, of course, again, we employ the term Torah in a much more general sense. Well, here, I'm going to specifically employ the word Torah in a very specific and restrictive sense. Namely, when we speak of the Hebrew Bible, we speak of the Bible as comprising three essential components. What we describe as Torah, Nevim, and Ketuvim, and I'm sure many of you have heard the way Jews tend to refer to these three components by acronym as Tanakh, which is a Hebrew acronym that is identical to the Hebrew Bible. Now, what are these three components? The second, the prophets, comprises all of the books of the prophets, beginning with the book of Joshua, and historically, concluding with the prophets of the second temple period, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, who are the last of the prophets of the 12 minor prophets. The third component of the Hebrew Bible is the holy writings, the hagiographer, that includes various works that for one reason or another, we won't discuss this at length right now, we regard as not being prophetic per se, the book of Psalms, the book of Proverbs, and many other such works that are canonized as part of the Hebrew Bible. Those again 
are components two and three. And in contrast to them, we stress component number one, Torah. Torah, again, teaching, instruction. Torah, signifying here something that we regard as qualitatively distinct on a fundamentally different plane than the rest of the Bible. It is foundational in our beliefs that while everything in the Bible is inspired by God, guided by God, a formulation that expresses God's teachings to us, only the Torah is direct, explicit, divine dictation. And as a result, it has a qualitatively different status from the rest of the Bible. Now, I know that you know that my belief in the Torah as explicitly dictated by God is one that in various academic circles nowadays would be ridiculed. The whole enterprise of biblical criticism essentially arose in order to ridicule this belief in the divine origin of the Torah. I'm not going to dwell upon biblical criticism at this point at length, not because it's not something that demands a much more detailed, exhaustive treatment. It does. But I suspect that most of those who are participating in these sessions would regard the challenges of biblical criticism as inevitably, on some plane, secondary, simply because the foundation, the cornerstone, of the way we relate to the Torah and generally the way we relate to the Bible is number one, we believe in God. I know this may strike you as a pedestrian and self-evident observation, but on some plane, inevitably we need to bear in mind that biblical criticism arose in circles with background that was essentially rejecting belief in God as guide of everything that happens in this world. And whether it was disbelief in God altogether, or disbelief in God's continuing to be involved and to impact upon our lives in this world by making known to us his teachings and providing for us a formulation of his doctrine of right and wrong, of good and evil, for us. That is the very essence of life. Of course, as you undoubtedly already discern what I just said, don't expect me to ever provide you with any kind of definitive proof that biblical criticism is true or false. Obviously, in such matters, the whole enterprise of proof is an irrelevant one. The question was raised pertaining to archaeology, and I'm going to respond on a more general plane, and uh, I hope those who are involved in the social sciences will appreciate here that there is no offense intended, but Having been trained as I was in the exact sciences, which are so named for a reason, I must respectfully ask of social scientists to have a little bit more humility. By which I mean, let's not imagine to ourselves that in any of the social sciences, any of the inherently imprecise sciences, any sort of thesis can ever be articulated that is hermetically sealed and inviolable. And since we can't, 
we recognize that inevitably, as a case in point, while Bible critics will posit a documentary hypothesis in which, because of what they discern to be different stylistic nuances in Scripture, they were different authors of different components of the Torah, of the five books of Moses, our response, transparently, is, if we believe in God, God could certainly write in multiple styles. Of course, these stylistic nuances were well known by the ancients in our tradition as well. They explained them completely different terms that, from our perspective, are no less, indeed, much more compelling than positing multiple authors. Now, I can't prove that God was the author of the Torah, but can anyone presume to prove that he wasn't? In addition, it is, of course, important for us to bear in mind that one of the cornerstones of our belief in the Bible, and one of the cornerstones that biblical criticism rejected, is our belief in prophecy. So that while from the perspective of the Bible critic, the idea of a human being knowing that which has not yet happened is as absurd as any sort of claims of clairvoyance that we encounter nowadays, our response is, God could tell them. Just as God told Moses what to write down in the narrative of creation, so too God conveys to the prophets that which will be, even if it is not yet. There certainly isn't any reason for us to regard that as in any way inconceivable or disproven. Even as we recognize we haven't proven our position, but we do emphatically affirm it. And I'll add further, if you ask me, upon what foundation am I standing in affirming it? The foundation, more than any other, is an idea that we discussed a ways back in the first chapter of Genesis. A recurrent theme. Vayar Elokim Kitov. God saw that it was good. That is, God creates, but God doesn't create and, as it were, walk away as a disinterested party. God sees. He continues to relate to the world post-creation. And God evaluates and judges that it was good. If God remains involved in the world, from our perspective, it is, after all, veritably self-evident that if he's involved, he's going to convey to humanity his guidebook for how to live. To convey to us what is right or wrong, what is good or evil. And he did so. He gave us the Torah. There's an additional dimension that I feel compelled to stress here, and that is that in our positing that the Torah, as the written document that we have, was given to Moses, we should note that in contrast to other ancient works, the Torah speaks of a written document. Now, this certainly shouldn't be regarded as a trivial point. We know, after all, that the Homeric epics were maintained as an oral tradition for generations before they were written down. The Greeks didn't have a written language. And they made no claim that the stories had been written down at the time that they described. But as for the Torah, in Deuteronomy chapter 31, beginning with verse 24, and it was when Moses completed to write the words of this Torah upon the book in writing until it was finished. 
that Moses commanded the Levites, the bearers of the Ark of the Covenant of God, take this book of the Torah and place it beside the Ark of the Covenant of God your Lord, and there it shall be a testimony for you. And we read explicitly then about this book. So again, from our perspective, this book is real. This book is real and it comes from God. And to add one additional nuance that pertains to that very realization, we should note that what this book claims uniquely in all of human history is it is the product of a revelation that took place not to an individual or a group of individuals, but to an entire nation. I need to stress here, once again, the distinction to be drawn from our perspective between the rest of the Bible, the prophets and the hagiographer, the holy writings, on the one hand, and the Torah on the other. With respect to all the words of the prophets, when all said and done, while we definitely posit that they are all true, what that means is the prophet came to us and he convinced us that God spoke to him. Well, if I wanted to, to be cynical, I could say you could either take it or leave it. You could either believe it or choose not to believe it. But the Torah, it's something different. Something different because, again, you have a document that tells you what the circumstances of its composition were. In particular, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, we read, beginning in verse 10, the day upon which you stood before God your Lord at Chorev, at Sinai, when God said to me, Assemble the people, and I will make heard to them my word, that they shall learn to revere me all the days that they live upon the earth, and teach that to their children. Following verse, And you drew close, and stood beneath the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire to the heart of the heavens, darkness cloud and mist and the following verse God spoke to you from out of the fire you heard the sound of the words you saw no image only the sound but you heard that sound you were party to the revelation yourselves no one merely told you about it it was you. You were there. And likewise, in the following chapter, in chapter 5, beginning with verse 2, God, our Lord, made a covenant with us at Chorev, at Sinai. Not with our ancestors did God make this covenant. Rather, with us. These here today, all of us alive, face to face, God spoke with you at the mountain from out of the fire. An extraordinary experience of divine revelation. Now, let's consider what the implications of that are. And I can see at the outset, this is an observation that was made by the ancients, but I think it's an awfully compelling one. We have here a document that posits, number one, that the entire nation was party to an explicit divine revelation. Number two, that it was recorded adjacent to those events. Now, how would we imagine the falsification of such a story? If anyone were to come along at any time in history and present to the people this book. They look inside, 
it describes a divine revelation, if it were not true, a divine revelation to which either they or their own direct ancestors were party, and they never knew about it. This isn't like a prophet coming and appealing to your trust that God spoke with him. This is a book that says God spoke with you or your own ancestors. And we didn't know about it. And moreover, this book makes so many demands on our lives. No one would ever accept such a book. It's inconceivable that they would have felt any compunction about rejecting it out of hand. Unless, of course, they knew that it was true. They knew they could not possibly reject a story that they all unequivocally knew was God's truth revealed. Significant to note, in the Second Temple period, in particular toward the end of the Second Temple period, there was a lot of divisiveness in the nation of Israel. There were a number of groups that split off the nation and rejected various components of traditional Jewish beliefs. Not one rejected belief in the divine origin of the written text of the Torah. Because that was something that was so axiomatic to everyone. It was so obviously true to everyone. No one could countenance any dispute on that subject. With all the rebelliousness, that was something that was beyond question. So, on the one hand, it is imperative for us to consider the uniqueness of the origin of the Torah. It is, of course, simultaneously crucial for us to appreciate the implication in terms of its ongoing relevance. That is, on the one hand, it is important for me to stress we regard every word of the Bible as relevant on an ongoing basis. If it would not have been relevant to all generations, it would not have been written down and canonized in the Bible. That's all on the one hand. On the other hand, we do not learn actual instruction that definitively guides us in our lives from anything other than the Torah, the five books of Moses themselves. And this is an idea that is perhaps most aptly articulated in Deuteronomy, in chapter 29, verse 28. The hidden matters are God our Lord's, and the revealed are ours and our children's forever to do all the words of this Torah. And of course, inevitably, we realize the eternal applicability is a necessary and inevitable outgrowth of the divine origin. So, at the outset then, when I respond to question number two, so far we've only addressed the first component of it, how did Moses get the book of Genesis? You can appreciate what I mean in saying God told him. Because all of the Torah, from our perspective, is indeed the consequence of what God told Moses, word by word letter by letter, all of it, God's truth revealed to the world. So, of course, again, I'm going to reiterate. Is it true? It is all true. But inevitably, we still need to ask, what kind of truth? And it is in that vein that, of course, beyond recognizing that Moses knows about creation, despite people not having been created yet because God told them, when we ask, how do you relate to the Bible's description of creation, the Garden of Eden and similar stories, 
Here, the answer must be more nuanced. Altogether, as we have noted in the past, when I encounter in questions expressions like, according to Jewish tradition, or what is the Jewish view, you know it makes me uncomfortable. It makes me uncomfortable simply because in many such issues, there can indeed legitimately be multiple views. And then especially considering that what is most essential from the perspective of Judaism based upon the Torah is what we do. There can still be a fairly broad range of possibilities that pertain to the questions of what we believe. So, bearing that in mind, with respect to the question of how we relate to the Bible's description of creation, the Garden of Eden, and similar stories. My response is, there are indeed multiple points of view. If you ask me, is the Bible's description of creation and the Garden of Eden and so on the truth? I will state emphatically, unreservedly, every single word is the truth. But if you ask me, what truth? There is an ancient perspective that views the truth of the Bible's description of creation as allegory, not describing literal historical events, not describing scientific facts, but rather there to teach us ideas allegorically. I'll note as a case in point that one of the most famous classic scholars of Judaism, Rabbi Moses Maimonides, writes explicitly that not everything in the story of creation is to be understood according to its plain, simple meaning. And he goes on to present a gripping allegorical understanding of what the narrative means on a far, far more ancient basis. There is an ancient perspective articulated in the Midrash, specifically pertaining to the story of creation. And I feel compelled to share it with you. To relate the power, the might of the story of creation to flesh and blood and make it known to them is impossible, says the Midrash. And therefore, Scripture sealed it up with, in the beginning, God created, and so on. Now this is a profound and tantalizing thought. In order to appreciate what the Midrash is proposing here for your consideration, I'd like to provide the following tangible illustration. Let's say I give you a vessel a box, and as you peer over the rim to examine the contents, you're looking at what's inside, I tap you on the shoulder, and I point out to you, you're actually not seeing inside the box at all. In fact, what you're examining is an intricately painted lid that covers the box. So, not only are you not able to see what is inside the box, what you're seeing is, in fact, something else. So, if we integrate what this Midrash is telling us, what is it saying with respect to the truth of the story of creation? Is it implying, then, that the story of creation isn't true? My response, predictably, not at all. On the contrary, it is indeed affirming that the story is entirely true. Just what kind of truth? It's telling you that to convey to flesh and blood the might, the power of the story of creation, if you will, to convey the history and the science is impossible. It will get you nowhere. You won't understand it. And in any case, you'll miss the real point. 
rather. Conveying the might, the power of creation, not through the actual story, but through the lid. What the text of the Torah tells you, in the beginning God created and so on and so forth, precisely conveys in exactly that many words the compelling lessons, the compelling messages that we, each of us, need to integrate into our own lives from the story of creation in order to learn from it, in order to grow from it, in order to come closer to God. It's all true. But inevitably we're going to have to ask ourselves, just what sort of truth is it? In this context, I feel compelled to consider not just this second component of question two, but also together with that, the continuation in question number three. So, of course, at this point, I'll give you something of a response to how do you relate to the Bible's description of creation, the Garden of Eden, and similar stories, but more generally. What is the Jewish view regarding the Bible's historical authenticity? Do you believe that all the stories in the Bible and the miracles described in them are actual historical events? And of course, inevitably, in much of the same vein that I share with you the possibility that much of the description of creation can be allegory, I'll share with you here as well. Is everything necessarily a literal historical event? I think not, at least not necessarily. Is every word the truth? Definitely. To explain what I mean by that, I first like to review a couple of incidents that we've already had occasion to discuss in the sessions on Bible study in the past. You may recall our discussion last year of Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18 portraying Abraham's encounter with the three strangers coming down the road and showering them with hospitality and so on. So, one possibility is the Bible is describing an actual historical event that took place. Abraham saw the three strangers, he invited them and showered them with hospitality and then it emerged, they were angels. There's another possibility that we discussed, which is that the entire narrative is in fact taking place in a prophetic vision in Abraham's mind. So of course, if we take the first approach, if we take the approach that the strangers were real, Abraham saw them, he ran to greet them and everything else, if we ask then, is the story true? Obviously, our answer is yes. And what if we take the second approach? If we take the second approach that the whole narrative is taking place in a prophetic vision in Abraham's mind, pardon me, but does that make it any less true? Is something that's taking place in prophecy as opposed to in mere physicality? Again, of course, I'm going to reiterate true regardless. It's teaching. It is instruction regardless. We learn from it regardless. Do we learn history? Maybe yes. Maybe no. But the answer to the question about history can never be as central, as important, as that deeply rooted appreciation. It is true because it is conveying to us God's truths revealed in the world. To share with you another couple of examples, at least briefly, to illustrate the point, another example that we also had occasion to discuss in the Bible studies this year, in Ezekiel chapter 4, actually chapter 4 and into chapter 5, we read a very involved description of an extraordinary mission that God 
gives to Ezekiel. It's a very involved portrayal of the symbolism of Jerusalem under siege. I'm not going to belabor the point by reading the entire narrative, which I highly recommend for each of you afterward. What I will stress, however, is in chapter 4, verse 4 in Ezekiel, now lie upon your left side and put the iniquities of the house of Israel upon it, upon it referring to the brick upon which he has etched the image of Jerusalem. For the number of days that you will lie upon it, you will bear their iniquity. And how many days is the prophet supposed to maintain that posture lying on his left side? The following verse gives us the answer. In verse 5, you shall lie there 390 days and bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And afterward, well, afterward we get to verse 6. What you do afterward is you turn over and lie on your right side another 40 days. So did the prophet actually lie there for a total of 430 days doing nothing but staring at a frying pan that was between him and the brick. If you read the passage, you'll see what I'm talking about. Is that all? Or is this something that took place in the prophet's vision, in his mind, without any external expression? To take a somewhat more grating example, Isaiah chapter 20. In Isaiah chapter 20, at the beginning of the chapter, we read of God's command to Isaiah, verse 2. At that time, the word of God came by the hand of Isaiah, son of Amos, saying, Go and open the sackcloth that is upon your loins, and shed the shoes that are upon your feet, and he did so. Prophet Isaiah did so. Going, I'm just reading what the text says, naked and barefoot. And in case you imagine that this naked and barefoot scene lasted for uh, maybe a few minutes, a couple of seconds, the following verse. And God said, as my servant Isaiah went naked and barefoot, three years this shall be a sign and a wonder upon Egypt and upon Ethiopia that they will go into captivity naked and barefoot as well, and so on and so forth. Naked and barefoot. Is it true? My response again, unreservedly. Every word of the Bible I take as true. What kind of truth? We can have a legitimate disagreement on that question. Whether it is the sort of truth that is revealed to the flesh and blood eyes in the physical world, or a deeper truth that is revealed not to what I could call outside, but rather insight in the realm of prophecy of the prophet. What's the answer? No, there can be more than one legitimate answer here. And that's critical here. It's critical in particular when we consider the final component of question three. Do you consider someone who does not believe the altar place a heretic? Now, I have to admit that I feel somewhat uncomfortable getting into questions of heresy here altogether, deciding who is or is not a heretic. In the final analysis, obviously, the only one who needs to judge and decide and determine whether someone is or is not a heretic, 
is the judge, and he's not giving us his job any time in the future either. So um, while I don't feel compelled to judge anyone with respect to such questions, I do feel compelled to answer, at least in principle. Would we regard it as a heresy to not believe that these events took place? On the one hand, the answer should be self-evident from what I already stated. That is, I definitely posit that there is legitimate grounds for disagreement. If we agree, and I think every sincere Bible believer necessarily agrees that every word of the Bible is true, then we agree on that. We can amicably disagree among ourselves, even within ourselves, as to whether that truth is one that was manifest in the physical world of nature and history, or in a spiritual realm that was manifest in neither. But there's an additional caveat that I do need to stress here. And as we shall see, it's going to have critical implications with respect to the remaining question, question number four. That is, if our questioning the historicity of events in the Bible is because we just simply don't know if God would really expect Isaiah to be going around naked and barefoot, or Ezekiel to be lying on one side or the other for 430 days, that's certainly legitimate. If, however, it is because we don't believe in the possibility of God communing with man in prophecy, or we don't accept the possibility of miracles taking place in the world, that is, we don't regard God as still involved or we don't regard God as sovereign of nature who can overcome nature. In that instance, the question is not whether the specific event did or did not take place, but such a belief is definitely heresy. And that's a critical point for us to emphasize here. That is, the question that we need to address in considering the stories in the Bible is, Upon what basis are we going to accept them or are we not going to accept them? The foundation for us necessarily is twofold. Number one, we believe that every word of the Bible is true. Number two, we believe God is God. Within the framework of those two questions, again, we could certainly have legitimate disagreements. And that's really the crux of the issue that brings us to our fourth and final question for today. In the Bible's description of the exodus from Egypt, the number of Israelites, 600,000 men over age 20, is amazing. A study by Colin Humphreys reduces this figure to a few tens of thousands. Should Bible believers consider this conclusion acceptable? So before I consider this last question, should Bible believers consider this conclusion acceptable? Let me state at the outset. And I hope what I'm stating is going to be clear enough that there won't be any room for any further uncertainty on this score. I emphatically, definitively, unquestioningly believe that the exodus from Egypt included 600,000 men over the age of 20, which means necessarily millions of people, because of course 600,000 men over age 20 and a comparable number of women and all the children would necessarily give us millions of people. Yes, I believe unreservedly that the Exodus included those numbers as described in the Torah as enshrined in our tradition. As for the various objections to that position, first of all, I feel compelled to return to my point about social scientists. Again, with all due respect, let's not 
delude ourselves by arrogance or hubris into thinking that social scientists actually are engaged in the sort of exact sciences that would enable them to reach definitive, unambiguous, and unimpeachable conclusions. They're not. As for the particular issues that might rouse our ire in believing that the Torah's narrative is true, first of all, the old objection, and it is indeed an old objection, that Jacob came down to Egypt with a total of 70 souls. And from that beginning, we could end up with a nation that would, by all accounts, number millions. My response to that is, first of all, you see, all of Israel is described as Jacob's family. So they all came down to Egypt. And as for the rate of increase, well, I don't know from the Bible itself exactly what that increase rate was, but I can tell you that in Exodus, in chapter 1, verse 7, we read, and the people of Israel multiplied and swarmed and increased and became mighty exceedingly, exceedingly, and the whole land was filled with them. Now, mind you, I have no reason to posit this was a natural rate of increase. It wasn't natural. And even more so, in verse 12, after the Egyptians begin to afflict and oppress Israel, as they afflicted them, so they increased, and so they burst forth. Well, when God's running the show, there really aren't any difficulties here. And when you go through the arithmetic, I'm not going to be made the point with geometric progressions, it really isn't at all difficult over the course of the sojourn in Egypt to increase from 70 souls to the numbers that emerge from the Bible's narrative. Ah, but you might argue, where are the artifacts? If so many people went through the Sinai Peninsula, Shouldn't we find, for example, mountains and mountains of worn-out artifacts, of worn-out clothing, to which I'll respond simply and unabashedly. If I had to describe the way God guided Israel in the wilderness in one word, that one word would be, it was miraculous. And so, for example, we read in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 4, your clothing did not wear out from upon you. So where are those mountains and mountains of worn clothing? There weren't any. It was a miracle. And where is all of the refuse from what it took to support all of those people to provide them with food and sustenance. The previous verse, chapter 8 in Deuteronomy, verse 3. God afflicted you and hungered you and fed you the manna that you didn't know. You were fed by miracles, well. Indeed, what characterizes that 40 years sojourn in the wilderness is nothing if not an ongoing stream of miracles. So, does this in any way prove the historicity of the Bible's account of the Exodus? Of course not. We aren't talking about proofs. We're talking about belief. We're talking about trust and conviction and the integrity of being able to say why I believe what I believe. And in responding then to that question, on the one hand, we've spoken of many hands today, should Bible believers consider this conclusion acceptable? You might say, well, why not? If indeed you believe that every word of the Bible is true, just you posit that this is an inner truth. 
and it's not a physical, historical truth. Didn't I just say a few minutes ago that that wouldn't constitute heresy? I have two critical points that I feel compelled to make here with which I conclude. Point number one, again, is the problem with accepting the historicity of the Exodus a problem of some deeply rooted sensitivity with respect to the teachings of the Bible that lead you to posit that the story is not a historical event, or is it because you aren't believing that God is God, that God is involved in this world and sovereign over this world, that God is creator of nature and can transmute nature, and that therefore miracles can be real. That's the first point. We believe that miracles are real. And if Colin Humphreys and his cohorts repudiate the historicity of the Exodus because they don't, that's not just an alternative way of looking at things. That's something we will definitely regard as an unacceptable conclusion. And finally, one additional nuance to emphasize here, which really brings us back to the very beginning. Recall in our stressing that the Bible is true and God is God. The most critical foundation here. And again, I'm going to add from my own personal perspective, as a leading Jew. The way I begin that core prayer every time I stand before God is addressing God as God of history. That God is involved in the world. That we see God's hand in history. What is so critical about the Bible's description of the Exodus is precisely that it is historical. That is you might posit with respect to a whole slew of other narratives in the Bible that the lessons that they convey are conceptual lessons that are, on some plane at least, divorced from, elevated beyond history. In the story of the Exodus, it is the very fact that it is historical that drives home this essential sensitivity that God is manifest here and now, in this world, we perceive him. So, impugning the historicity of the Exodus, to my mind, isn't just questioning the historicity of a particular narrative in the Bible. It is impugning the foundation of the Bible's theology, that God isn't just out there, that we perceive God down here in this world, that we do see God's guiding hand. We don't often understand that hand. It's there. We're not expecting some simplistic, facile answer to all of our prayers. We realize the way God runs the world is much, much more nuanced than that. And I can't help but add here, as a parenthetical note, when Job demands an answer to his challenges to God, and Job's friends argue, if you're suffering, it must be because you had it coming to you because you were a sinner. At the end of the book of Job, Job goes to the friends and says to them, you better have Job pray on your behalf because otherwise you'll be punished. You didn't speak of me correctly as Job did because he thought that everything was so simple and superficial, you missed the point. The world is complex, and the Bible is complex as well. We don't usually understand exactly what God is communicating in what we see in history, but we know he's speaking to us. We know the Bible in its totality, in all of its components, 
is indeed God speaking to us, God conveying to us his word, his guidance, his teachings, his truth. And as such, we know the key to our becoming more godly human beings lies in our taking his word seriously. So that's what it's all about. And that really is the culmination with respect to all of these questions. Exactly how to take the Bible seriously is a complex and nuanced question, and I hope in our discussion today we've gotten something of a sense of that nuance and that complexity. But to take the Bible seriously, that is the essence. We take every word of it seriously. Because we take our lives in this world seriously. And we know God is speaking to us. And we know God is guiding us. And it is through that appreciation and sensitivity that we strive to make ourselves worthy of his blessings. God bless you.